Good afternoon and welcome to the 2020 Nobel Inspired Lecture, which is jointly hosted by the South African National Research Foundation and the Embassy of Sweden in Pretoria. I am Mia Malan and I'm the editor of the Begesisa Center for Health Journalism in Johannesburg, and I'm honored to moderate this webinar today. If you'd like to tweet about the lecture, the hashtag to use is 2020 Nobel Lecture, and you can also follow the live tweets of the Swedish Embassy on at Sweden in SA. It's really no coincidence that we're having this event in early October this year, because the Nobel Inspired Lecture was planned to take place during the same period that the 2020 Nobel Prize laureates are being announced. And as you may know, the prizes for chemistry and physiology and medicine and physics were announced earlier this week. And today over lunchtime, we got to hear who the winner of the Nobel Prize for literature was. And tomorrow we get to hear who the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize is. We, just like with the Nobel Prizes, in very good company today because our speakers are two of the world's leading epidemiologists, Sweden's state epidemiologist, Dr. Anders Tegnell, and South Africa's co-chair of the country's COVID-19 Ministerial Advisory Committee, Professor Salim Abdul Karim. So both of our speakers today will be looking at how COVID-19, the epidemic that we've all been living through this year, has brought science to the forefront and has made it more meaningful or relevant to the general public. They'll both be making 15 minute presentations. After that, we'll be asking them a bit more. I'll be asking him some questions about their views. And I'll also be posing them some of your questions that you will send to us. You can post those questions on the Facebook pages of the National Research Foundation and the Embassy of Sweden in Pretoria. Or if you're joining us via Zoom, you can enter your questions in the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. If you'd like to tweet your questions, you would need to use our hashtag 2020 Nobel Lecture because we won't be able to find your questions without that hashtag. So we're now going to quickly hear a few words of support from the Embassy of Sweden and from the National Research Foundation, after which we will go to presentations of our speakers. I'd like to introduce the Deputy Ambassador of Sweden, Ami Larsen Jane. Mrs. Larsen Jane, please over to you. Thank you so much, Mia, uh, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank everybody involved in today's uh, virtual Nobel-inspired lecture, not least our partners at the National Research Foundation, uh, with uh, Dr. Damons representing them today. Uh, and also, of course, our two keynote speakers, Professor Salim Abdul Karim and Dr. Anders Tegnell, and also, of course, our eminent moderator, Mia Malan from Becky Sisa. Uh, we are very pleased to see that we have been able to continue the Nobel inspired lecture and the collaboration with NRF despite these challenging times. I'm also excited about the fact that we have moved into a digital format, allowing for more people to participate. So a warm welcome to you all. The Nobel Prizes are among the world's most prestigious awards. And from a Swedish perspective, we view them and the internationalism and excellence, excellence that they represent as part of our national identity. Today, as Mia said, the prize for literature was announced and tomorrow we'll have the Peace Prize winner announced. As much as Nobel is a celebration of excellence of individuals and the global impact of their achievements, it is also an opportunity to encourage dialogue about situations that affect the world and its future. I'm delighted to have two such eminent leaders in the science of COVID come together in this lecture with a leading role that has been played by science and scientists during this pandemic. It is a privilege for the embassy and of course for NRF also to offer this platform for them to share their thoughts on the meaning of science in the age of COVID-19. This virtual lecture will be a great opportunity to learn from them and also to put questions to them. It will also be an opportunity to hopefully inspire the next generation of scientists and creative innovators in South Africa and Sweden in the spirit of Alfred Nobel. I wish everybody a warm welcome and look forward to an insightful di dialogue about this important and topical issue. Thank you, over to you Mia. Uh, 
Thanks very much, Mrs. Lawson Jane. I'd now like us to move on to introduce Dr. Beverly de Mons. She's the Group Executive for Science and Corporate Relations at the National Research Foundation. Dr. de Mons, over to you. Thank you, Mia, and a very warm welcome to all our participants. To you, uh, Deputy Ambassador Amy Larson Jalen, and also to our eminent speakers here today. Um, we, this lecture is part of an annual series that we usually uh, host in a long standing collaboration between the NRF and the Embassy of Sweden in Pretoria. And this year, although virtual, offers us a perfect platform to continue and a dialogue, in this case, a global dialogue uh, around a topic that has affected our lives in unprecedented ways this year. It is also a real opportunity for us to bring together the excellence of the science as embodied through our two speakers uh, this afternoon, Professor Salim Abdul Karim and Dr. Anders Tegnal, um, and using both the perspectives of South Africa experience and the Sweden experience to bring to us a continuing conversation. Because although COVID has offered us a unprecedented time of tragic uh, consequences uh, for populations around the world, it's also brought for us a real opportunity for change, as we have seen in the change in the dialogue between science and society, between science and media, between science and policy makers. And this rich dialogue continues today. And as the NRF, we are very pleased through this collaboration to host such a dialogue because we really believe that uh, the science and the excellent science must uh, continue to be in dialogue with the communities that it serves. So thank you very much to everybody involved with this lecture, to our speakers, and also to all who are participating. And we encourage you to dialogue with our speakers through the question and answer session. Thank you very much, and please do enjoy this conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Demons. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, South Africa's Professor Salim Abdul Karim. As I've mentioned a bit earlier, Professor Abdul Karim is the co-chair of the country's Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19, and he's also the director of the Center for the AIDS Program of Research, Caprisa. In addition to that, he holds quite a few professorships, two of them at Columbia University in New York and Harvard University in Boston. If you'd like to follow him on Twitter, his handle is at Prof Abdul Karim. Professor Abdul Karim, over to you. Thank you very much, Mia. It's a great pleasure and an honor to share today's uh, webinar with uh, my colleague, Dr. Tegnell uh, from Sweden. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. What I hope to do in the next 14 minutes or so is to just give you some of my impressions about how the meaning of science has changed over COVID-19. But I'd like to start with some hearty congratulations to several of my colleagues and friends uh, in the, uh, receiving the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their work on hepatitis C, and of course to the wonderful work that has been done by Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudner on the CRISPR-Cas9. Croatia and I had the pleasure of being with them at the L'Oreal Awards in 2016, and this is a really fitting tribute to you know, the world's great, great scientists. So I'm going to talk about how the meaning of science has changed in the era of COVID-19. Literally in the last you know, seven or eight months, I'm gonna talk about the good, I'm gonna talk about the bad, and I'm gonna talk about the complicated. So let's start with the good. good you know, always a good place to start. Let's start with the good. I'm gonna talk briefly about how science has become a common pastime. It's become fast, transparent, and open. So COVID-19 
has made science accessible to almost everyone. Almost everyone, anyone can access real time data on COVID-19 worldwide. There's on the net, all of the data you can possibly want. Lay people using, are now using epidemiological concepts. I have my nephews, you know, as a WhatsApping me about, you know, did yesterday's case fatality rate change by 2%? I mean, people who would, would otherwise not even know what the word meant. And today we're seeing all of these individuals undertaking complicated analyses, uh, looking at the number of tests and you know, wondering why they're not doing enough tests you know, this week. We've also seen a rapid explosion of new evidence, of new knowledge that's been coming in rapid fire. We've had just over 62,000 articles. We've got a whole lot of new rapid way in which pub articles are getting published through preprint servers. And paywalls are being dropped all over the place. Articles are now mostly free if they are COVID-19 related. We're seeing enhanced collaboration across the world. We're seeing multidisciplinary research in ways that we haven't seen before. In essence, we have seen a transformation of science from what used to be the domain of elderly, gray-haired gentlemen in a library at the university to one where anyone with a computer can now start in their homes looking at all of this information on COVID-19. It's a new level of accessibility and immediacy. You, you can see what's going on right now today about this epidemic in the whole world. So let's look at South Africa. What do the data tell us about South Africa? We had our first case on the 5th of March. And in the first three weeks, our epidemic was growing very rapidly, on par, almost case for case with that in the UK. The epidemic was doubling every two days. We had a very early intervention. Oh, I think it was about day 10 after the first case, when we only had about 400 cases and no deaths the government declared a state of disaster that led to schools being closed, international travel being halted, mass gatherings being restricted. And then shortly thereafter, we had the in, uh, imposition of the lockdown. And what we saw is that from that point, due largely to the restrictions of the state of disaster and contributed to by the lockdown, we saw a drastic change from an epidemic doubling every two days to an epidemic doubling every 15 days. But we always knew that as we would ease our restrictions, we would expect this epidemic to come back. So what it did, it bought us some time. And I'll talk about that time briefly. It bought us time to build our field hospitals, to ensure we had adequate supplies of oxygen, to ensure that we could scale up our testing, to put in place all of the prevention mechanisms. And what we saw is when we eased our restrictions and went from level four to level three, the epidemic took off. And we reached a peak where we were in excess of 13,000 cases per day for a, a, a short duration. But just like all other epidemics, the number of cases rose, plateaued, and then they have come down. And we've seen that mirrored by the gray, gray bars at the bottom when you look at admissions, and you can see what a slight lag of about two to three weeks, an increase in the deaths that occurred. And so now we are at the stage where we are post our initial surge, and we are crossing fingers because in, in the horizon somewhere looms a second surge. And we're doing what we can to prepare for that and doing our best to avoid that second surge. The basis of the intervention was that initially we would normally in, institute public health interventions through a very uh, straightforward process. We'd understand how the disease is spread. We'd look at the evidence for how to prevent it. We'd develop programs. We'd pilot them. We'd implement them to early adopters. Well, we didn't have time. In this epidemic, you wait, you lose a week and you lose the initiative. So early quick action was needed. And that was government action. But that led to anxiety. People didn't know a lot about what was going on. They were now being told, stay at home. Is this what's going on here? But we knew that this was not going to be sustainable. 
it had to change. And we had to move from a situation where people were anxious, from anxiety to agency, where they could now start taking control of their own lives and influencing their own risk. And to get to that point, we had to pivot from a situation of government action to a situation of individual action, where people had to move from anxiety to self-efficacy, where they had to now ensure that they were doing their social distancing, hand hygiene, wearing of masks. And that intermediate step was to in, in order was, was there in order to get us to our approach of collective community action. Because we had to move from people taking action just for their own benefit to people taking action for the community's benefit. Realizing that if I put myself at risk, I'm putting my friends at risk, I'm putting my family at risk, I'm putting my community at risk. And that needed to build on our fundamental belief system in our country, in our norm of our context, our social context, where in the concept of Ubuntu, we believe that I am because you are. So I am safe because you are safe. You are safe because I am safe. And building that collective interdependence is going to be critical as we move forward in dealing with this epidemic. But in all of this, science has become an empowering process. It's become so because it's, we've been going through a process of the democratization of knowledge. It's accessibility to everyone. The science is no longer confined to ivory towers. The language and idiom of epidemiology. If I was asked in February, you know, what do you do? I say, well, I'm an epidemiologist. Oh, are you a skin doctor? You know, I've got this rash on my finger. Can you look at it? Now, I don't tell you, nobody right now thinks I'm a skin doctor anymore. Everybody now talks about epidemiology and people have, have, are seeing how that scientific evidence empowers them to be able to act and to take agency over their own lives. And science has now become the bulwark against conspiracy theory, fake news, fear mongers. The Cornell University did the study which was published in the New York Times where they looked at 38 million English articles on COVID-19. Can you believe it? 1.1 million have misinformation, mostly conspiracies. I won't tell you who was largely responsible for promoting those conspiracies, but I think the title says it all. So as we look at the good, it has been an amazing uh, 10 months to see how science has changed. But with that comes the bad, and that comes from looking at how scientific evidence was eclipsed to promote unproven treatments and further politicians' views. We saw that with hydroxychloroquine, where a really poor observational study gets published in a reputable journal like Antimicrobial Agents, and then gets picked up by politicians who talk about we bought tremendous amounts of hydroxychloroquine, science that it works well. I mean, this is somebody who has no clue about how scientific evidence is built and how regulatory processes are critical in order to ensure that we have scientific standards. And this is not something that has no effect. The, the, the knock-on effect is that a vital drug for patients with lupus started running low. But fortunately, science eventually prevails. Several clinical trials were subsequently published, including in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that actually it's ineffective, can be life-threatening, and that it just highlighted the importance of rigor. And it made all of us realize that we need to beware of the snake oil salesman, for he flourishes when people are desperate and we need to protect ourselves and science helps us do that. So let me go to the last of the three points I want to make. We've dealt with the good, we've dealt with the bad, let's talk about the complicated. And here I'm gonna talk about how science has become the accepted basis to temporarily suspend fundamental rights to reduce viral submission without a full appreciation of the real challenge of scientific uncertainty. So we saw in, by April the 1st, 86 countries had instituted national or subnational lockdown. In our own country, we had instituted a lockdown on the 15th of March and, well, instituted the state of disaster. So what was that evidence? Well, we had accumulated substantial evidence. If you look at, on the left-hand side, the, the notion that distance was central was pointed out very clearly in this study in a South Korean call center 
where one individual led to 79 of the 137 employees in this call center becoming infected and how prolonged close, close contact was central. So that gave us the information we were looking for to understand the importance of person-to-person -person spread through contact and droplets and how distance becomes important. We began to understand the role of hand hygiene because we saw how contamination was occurring, how the virus could remain on surfaces for days. In this study in the Journal of the American Medical Association, one patient in that study, they showed they could grow the virus. The virus was detected on the bed rail, on the chair, in the light switches behind the bed, on the doctor's stethoscope, in the fan outlet, on the door handle, everywhere. And then we began to understand the critical importance of super spreading events, how poorly ventilated indoor events are really important. And then this, this data came from the MMWR and many others that showed the importance of you know, events like a choir practice leading to widespread transmission. And of course, you saw in the course of these last few days, another uh, super spreading event that took place in the lawn uh, of the White House. And so this notion, follow the science. It placed science at a level that gave it a, a mantle of legitimacy to limit individual freedoms. And there were examples being thrown around about countries that were following the science and countries that were not following the science. And that those who were doing so were doing better. Well, in looking at this challenge of you know, uh, how does following the science define what we do? It actually ignores a very fundamental issue. So what happens when the evidence is limited and the scientific uncertainty is really high? When I go back to when I was trying to understand what's going on in this epidemic in February and March, there was very little known. In fact, I did a search looking for uh, articles published on a lockdown. I could only find three. Uh, an article that just talked about a lockdown in Mexico for swine flu, uh, an article that looked at the lockdown in Sierra Leone for Ebola, and this handbook that came from China. So is the lockdown necessary? How strict? How long? Well, these three publications didn't even address these issues. So it's a major challenge because the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic changes rapidly, and we need to change our response. And the same with masks. When South Africa instituted uh, mandatory mask wearing, this was in the face of very contradictory evidence. And we did so eight weeks before WHO recommended because WHO couldn't come up with a consensus viewpoint. So let me end with just making five concluding remarks. In the age of COVID-19, we have seen how science has changed, becoming faster, more open, defined, what people can and cannot do. Science is now defining that. And science has adopted and assumed a new importance in decision-making. Through COVID-19, it has taken on many new meanings. Science is a guiding light. Science is demystifying what's in store. Science is a savior in the pandemic response. But science is about uncertainty in the midst of data, contestation of ideas, differing interpretations, and is not necessarily value-free. Scientific conclusions are views, they are interpretations of evidence, and with substantial uncertainty. They are more shades of gray than they are black and white. So we take the good, we take the bad, and we take the complicated in science, mainly because it seems to be more objective than for decision-making than many of the alternatives. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Abdul Karim, for sharing your always really valuable insights. And um, we'll now move on to our second and final speaker, Dr. Anders Technol. Dr. Technol has been Sweden's state epidemiologist since 2013. He is also the Deputy Director General of the country's public health agency and the head of the Department of Public Health Analysis and Data Management. Dr. Technol is a medical doctor with a PhD in infectious disease. Dr. Technol, over to you. Thank you very much. And thanks very much to be invited to this very nice opportunity to talk together with our South African colleagues and um, 
I also would like to thank uh, Professor Karim very much for an excellent lecture. I could, I'm sure the two of us could discuss a lot of this, but I basically think that you have a lot of good points and I, and I share all of them I've said very much. I think you really made a good analysis of what we've been through uh, this last few months um, in a way that I've seen not that many people to do before. So it was really illuminating. I will take a slightly different approach to this and mainly focus on our experience in Sweden. But I think they, in a very good way, mirrors uh, <clears throat> what Professor Karim has talked about. Let's see if I can get my... So, <clears throat> um, I'm not going to say so much about the background, but since um, Sweden might not be that all that well known in South Africa, just let me tell me a little bit about the public health agency in Sweden. As you know, Sweden is a country far up north. We have about 10 million inhabitants. We have an elderly population with 20% of our population being above 65, which is very important to, to know and remember when you go in, when you talk about COVID-19, who is so age dependent in a way it hits people. Uh, we have a very dense decentralized system for our health care and, and public health, and that's good to have in the background. Uh, the public health agency in Sweden um, is a national expert agency under the Ministry of Health, uh, one of quite a lot of agencies that we have in Sweden. We have a long tradition of having agencies that are, have a lot of independence and a lot of responsibilities in many different areas, not least public health. So we work with surveillance and health promotion in all different areas, I would say. Uh, we do coordinate the communicable disease prevention and control that is actually implemented by the, the regions in the country. Uh, and we are the contact point to WHO in many ways, one of them the international health regulation. We don't do any research of our own, uh, but we collect, analyze, and report a lot of various data collecting from our own data and also from the different registers that exist in Sweden, which is, gives us a lot of opportunities to, to look very carefully at what's happening. So what have we done in Sweden? Uh, I think it's Professor Karim did a very nice uh, view of this. How can you actually work evidence like with a disease that we never seen before. And how can you choose your measures uh, when there is so little evidence for what's gonna work and what's not, not gonna work? Of course, to a certain extent, you can take experience from other diseases and, and they will help you to a certain extent, but uh, not all that far. Uh, in Sweden, I think we could happily uh, jump the first step you talked about when it comes to uh, getting your population behind you. I, and I think that's because we have a very long tradition in Sweden when it comes to working together with our population. And there is a very high level of trust between the, the population and the agency and, and the political level. And I'll come back to that later. Uh, which meant that we could actually move into the second part quite quickly and base our response on the combination of binding regulations and voluntary measures, because we knew that voluntary measures in Sweden works very well. And we have a long tradition that uh, among others, we have voluntary vaccination program for children and we reach 98% of all children in every birth cohort. But still some binding regulations were needed, uh, mainly directed toward different institutions and so on. And, uh, one of them was the ban on visiting nursing homes uh, because we had a lot of problems with the nursing homes in the beginning, a lot of spread error and a lot of mortality in those. Um, we also looked a lot at schools. What are we going to do about the schools? We decided that primary schools could keep on working, but secondary schools needed to work on a distance and that also needed a legal background to do that. And we also realized, like many of us realized, that big gatherings, like Professor Karim also pointed out, are dangerous. So we limited gatherings to 50 people. Uh, we also knew from the experience, not least in the European Alps, uh, during the skiing vacation, that restaurants and those kind of inst institutions also were places where we see this kind of spread, spreading events. And, and we had a lot of regulations to stop that in the restaurants. But we also worked very much with voluntary measures. And as we stick very much to trying to keep people to keep distance from each other, especially if you're sick and told everybody to stay home if if they were sick, which is quite possible in Sweden because you get financial compensation even if you stay home when you're sick. Uh, so that worked really well. We tell, told people to meet as few people as possible to keep a distance. 
hand washing, of course, very important, and to try to limit the use of public transport as much as possible. And all of this had a lot of impact. Um, schools, I think, are interesting here, and I think school the experience from school varies in, in different countries. Uh, we tried to look at the evidence in the beginning. We saw very little of evidence for the effect of closing schools, but we saw a lot of evidence for bad effects of closing schools. And, and therefore, in the context of Sweden, we decided to keep schools up to the grade of 10 open. And I think our experience from that are very positive. We saw, we have seen very few negative uh, things from that. And we have even made a comparison with our Finnish colleagues who closed the schools, and we cannot really see any big differences. Uh, between the two countries that can be related back to the schools. But the schools, of course, has to follow the same recommendations, voluntary interventions that we asked everybody else about. Avoid, a big, uh, avoid big gatherings, see to your hand hygiene, see to that the children stay home if they have symptoms and, and so on. And doing that, um, the spread in the schools were very limited in Sweden. Uh, teachers were not sick and more than any other professions and so on. So that worked really well. And was at least to some extent based on the science in the area. Uh, we of course know that epi epidemics is something we're gonna to have to live with and we have lived with. Um, and they have shaped our societies in many ways. And I think one of the interesting aspects is now to look into the future and see how is uh, the COVID-19 change our societies? Are we ever going back to what we call normal? Um, we also know that zoonotic diseases uh, are among the main new diseases that we always see, and uh, COVID-19 is just another example of that. Uh, when we talk about the evidence around this, of course, the basic tools to uh, handle epidemics and handle infectious diseases are very much the same, even if you, we go back several hundred years. We talk about quarantine, we talk about trying to keep people to have a distance from each other. Hygiene measures, very important. And then, of course, we can always hope for a vaccine, which is also what we're doing right now. Um, I think that we have seen how the epidemic fans out in different countries are very different. And of course, living standards are an important factor. And we can see that also very clearly in Sweden during COVID-19, that poor areas in the Swedish cities have been more severely hit, especially early on, uh, than the more affluent parts. So socioeconomic factors are so often in public health plays an important role also in COVID-19. The epidemiology is to a certain extent perplexing when it comes to COVID-19, but still many of the basic functions also work here. So we need to think about, as I said, this pandemic has hit different countries very differently. And of course there is backgrounds to that that we need to think about. Uh, the demographic, demographic factors are important. Uh, we know that old age, uh, people with chronic diseases are se more severely hit than others. Uh, among young people, especially among children, this disease does seem to pass without any bigger problems at all. And of course, that makes it different in a, in a country with an aging population like Sweden. We need to think about it a little bit different than a, uh, a country like South Africa with a much younger population. The health of the population uh, plays a certain ex role for sure. Um, how important it is, we don't really know but uh, prevalence of underlying risk factors very much chronic diseases are important. Healthcare systems also plays a role, I think. In Sweden, one of the reasons why we didn't really have to go in with really harsh measures to start with is that we have a, a fairly good and, and fairly big healthcare system and it could change very quickly and we could increase the capacity for COVID-19 care in hospitals very quickly. So. Um, we could, we didn't really need all that much time to keep, uh, to get the healthcare system in shape to take care of the COVID-19. And actually, the number of ICU beds in Sweden doubled in a very short time, and there was always at least 20 to 30 percent of the ICU beds were empty and waiting for COVID-19 uh, patients. So we managed with our strategy, uh, which on the surface looks less stringent than many other countries uh, still um, achieve one of our major goals, and that is to keep our health care system working. And then finally, 
uh, in any country, the governance and the society uh, plays a large role. What kind of legal framework do you have for different kind of measures? Not least, what kind of um, trust do you have between um, the society and the political and the agency level, which I think the Professor Kersim pointed out very good, very well. Uh, we can look at this page and basically it's what we've already heard. There is an enormous amount of sci new science out there, 300 new articles every day. And we have in the agency in Sweden, I think around five to 10 people just trying to, to keep up on what's published to see what can we actually use. Uh, but unfortunately, this massive amount of new science has also uh, produced quite a lot of science that has not been that good. And uh, it has also meant that for any kind of new idea you have about uh, the COVID-19 and what to be done about it, you can always find at least one article that proves that we, what you are saying is true. Uh, so the massive amount of new research has not only helped us, it's also made life, I think, to a certain extent more difficult. So this is just a, we can pass that. Um, we have spent quite a lot of time in, in Sweden uh, collecting data and analyze that data to try to understand what the epidemic does to us. We have a national database which collects all cases of communicable diseases uh, on by personal identification numbers. So we can run this database together with other databases and get an idea of what parts of our population are worse hit, uh, what kind of professions are worse hit, and, and, and many similar things that like that, which uh, makes it possible for us to steer our response most clearly to different areas. Uh, we have a number of other registers, of course, on mortality, intensive care use, and so on, um, that we can combine with our uh, main data set with the people that actually are diagnosed with the disease. Uh, we do a fair amount of genome sequencing of the virus, and, and that has told us that the introduction in Sweden uh, took place simultaneously from, from a number of different countries. And it was a massive introduction uh, early on for many different sources at the same time. Uh, we do also a lot, lot of continuous surveys. Uh, we can follow compliance with recommendations and can see that our recommendations have been followed to a very high degree all through this um, pandemic. And still today we have a more than 80% of the population tells us in our surveys that they follow our recommendations. Uh, we're also setting up um, data sets and data coverage so we can follow the vaccine, what the vaccine will help us with, what kind of coverage will uh, follow and so on. Um, so in the we also have a continuous dialogue with uh, our scientific community in Sweden, and that's what I think this agency is always doing continuously. And we have a lot of networks out in the academic area. A huge proportion of our the, the people that staff our agency have a background in academia, and many of them have also PhDs. So we have a lot of connect, connections to science research, even if we don't do all that much science and research ourselves anymore. Um, of course, there's been a lot of debate in Sweden, what is the best way forward, and uh, we have people from academia both agreeing with us and disagreeing with us, and I think that's uh, what's going to happen in, in this time and days, especially when the, the basic science around COVID-19 is very sparse and new science uh, are difficult uh, to exactly understand what it says and what it does not say. Um, so much of the researchers we have had a lot of contacts with and we used a lot of the research in uh, trying to adapt our uh, strategy much better to to the actual situation so we do share data with a lot of researchers we researchers also share data with us uh, we do sometimes do studies of our own we sometimes commission studies out into academia so there is a lot of this connection between us and all the different Swedish universities, as I said, among them, the Karolinska Institute. Um, but as you said, Professor Kassim, it has been a huge challenge for communicating in this time of rapidly evolving and sometimes misinterpreted data, uh, sometimes very often conflicting studies. 
Um, so that's really been a challenge to try to find what is actually science saying it these days. And I think that's something we're all going to take with us and try to get better at it in the long run, how we quickly can find out what science actually tells us. Um, there are underserved populations in Sweden. We have almost 20% of the Swedish population have a background in different countries from all over the world. And reaching them is not as easy as reaching the population that's uh, been born in Sweden. So that's one been one of our challenges when, when communic communicating. So just to finalize um, some questions, how well have we been um, acting when it comes to in, informing our actions from science or actions related to COVID-19? I think that's very relevant because many of the first things, many of the first measures we took, there were very little background to uh, say that what we were going to do would have an effect and how big that effect would have. And not least, what are the, what are the negative aspects of many things, not least the lockdowns that we have been looking on. So we need to, I think, have a still closer collaboration with academia to really see that the questions we need to have answers for, we get, we get answers to that as quickly as possible. And how we can share those answers with our population through media and through other channels. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop there and so we get some time left over for questions. Thanks very much, Dr. Technol, for sharing your insight and thoughts on, the, on science in the age of COVID-19. We now have a bit of time for discussion with our speakers, and I see quite a few questions have already come in from, from all of you. And if you have not already done so and will still like to send a question, you can post it in Zoom in the Q&A section. There's a whole team who's looking at the questions and giving them to me or you can post them on the Facebook pages of the National Research Foundation or the Swedish Embassy in Pretoria. And also I'd like to remind you of our hashtag 2020 Nobel Lecture if you would like to tweet your questions or tweet about the lecture um, and your comments about it. I would like to start off by asking Dr. Tegnell and um, Professor Slim um, Abdul Karim also for his input on a question that someone has posed here about uncertainty. Both of you have extensively spoken about the uncertainty that science poses. I think Professor Salim Abdul Karim said it's science equals uncertainty in the midst of data. And that has, of course, been a very hard thing to communicate to the public. And Daniel Moore has asked a question, what are your thoughts on the unintended consequences the science transparency has had on public trust in science, given that many people do not understand the scientific findings being shared and that it can differ, that scientists can differ um, with each other and it doesn't necessarily make them wrong. Um, Dr. Technol, can we start with a response from you and then we can and move on to the professor. Thank you. I think that's a very good question because we have had that discussion very much in Sweden. How can different scientists interpret data so very, very differently? Um, but I think, and I, and I think in the beginning that caused a lot of uh, questions from the public, uh, a lot of to a certain extent anxiety. But I think as uh, we already talked about, this has also been a learning experience from the public. And I think one of the things that I can feel, at least in Sweden, is the public have understood that science is not always yes or no. It can also be something in between. And you need more science to be actually quite clear about what you need to do. And I think from the agency side point of view, we have really tried to communicate. We are not quite certain, but we act on the best possible evidence we have right now. And if more evidence come in, okay, uh, we are quite happy to, to change according to that, which we also have had to do over time. Thank you. Professor Abdul Karim? Yeah, perhaps I'll just add to what Anders has, has pointed out. I think if the public had to uh, you know, have a hidden camera in one of my center's research meetings, they would think that we're in the midst of a war amongst us, because that's what makes vibrant research institutes. 
we debate, we argue with each other, we have differences of opinion all the time. And you must know in my situation, it's even more complicated because I work with my wife and she and I have differences of opinion almost on a daily basis about what the data are saying. It's not a problem. The public needs to understand differences among scientists is not personal. It's not conflict. It's just the scientific process. That's how the science eventually emerges. And that if we didn't have those differences of opinion, then we have a problem. Because then we have groupthink, and then we're going to make mistakes because we have groupthink. But because we have diversity of views in science, we come out with what is most likely to be the best. And in South Africa, it has been completely misunderstood. People believe, oh, the ministerial advisory committee, they are fighting with each other. That's, not for, that's just scientific process. That's good for what we want. So I think that's the point you're trying to get to, that we need the public to understand the nature of the way in which contradictions, conflicts, differences of views are dealt with in science in a very constructive, collegial way. Thank you very much, Professor Karim. On that note, there's a question from Robin Crew in South Africa, which relates to the controversy of this different opinions on science. Um, she's asking, was there any science behind the alcohol and tobacco bans in the country? So the alcohol and tobacco bans were put in place before the Ministerial Advisory Committee. And I don't know what science was uh, brought to bear in that decision-making. I was certainly not involved when those bans were imposed under level five. Uh, we learned with hindsight that actually the alcohol restrictions had a major impact. I mean, we we reduced mortality by thousands uh, with the alcohol ban. It wasn't an intended consequence. It was an unintended consequence. And we began to see how uh, when we lifted the restrictions on alcohol, our ICU beds started filling up with all the motor vehicle accidents, the interpersonal violence. And so we began to understand actually the impact of alcohol restrictions. So. There was, you know, in terms of what was the initial rationale, I can't comment on that. I wasn't there and I wasn't part of it. I can tell you with hindsight what we found. Thank you, Professor. Um, I'd like to move on to Dr. Tegnell to ask him a question from Sohini Gowan. He's asking, how do you think healthcare professionals can capitalize on this newfound interest in and understanding of science by the public to simplify healthcare information and thus make better decisions about their health? Yeah, I think um, in Sweden, it has already capitalized on that because the trust in healthcare has increased dramatically when we ask people what kind of institutions they trust. The trust of healthcare has always been fairly high, but it's even higher now. Uh, we can also see that people that uh, apply for different kind of medical schools, uh, nursing, any kind of medical profession has increased dramatically. There's a huge interest in, in becoming a medical person, uh, which I think is good. And I also think this, as I said, I think this is also given the population even more insight in how, how important it is to follow science and, and to understand that science might be changing over time. And that is not uh, that anything, anything was wrong in the beginning, but just that more science sometimes changes uh, what was the answer to a question that might have been just yesterday, but comes no today when we know more about the subject. And I think that's something we get more of an acceptance to today than we used to do in the past. Professor Abdul Karim, did you want to comment on that question? No, I just wanted to add one aspect, to, just to pick on what Anders was saying, that, you know, it's not always clear to people that when you look at data and you have the benefit of hindsight, that you always look at the problem differently than when you did initially. Mm -hmm. When you had the problem initially, you didn't have the benefit of that. In, the, in, you know, in, in soccer, it's called the Monday morning coach. Mm -hmm. So on Monday morning, everybody knows exactly how the soccer match should have been played and how they would have actually scored 10 goals. But in the game, it's a very different situation. So 
one has to be careful that when you look at scientific evidence with hindsight, you have to be very careful in criticizing. I mean, criticism is not a problem, but you're going to be very, that it's not unfair because you didn't have the benefit of those insights up front. So I just want to pick up on that point that Amos made. Thank you, Prof. Um, there is a question that I'd like to ask that relates to many of the questions that are coming in. On that note of hindsight, has COVID taught us any lessons of how she, we, we should go forward with creating a space for science in society? And for instance, and in how we develop scientists or how we do science education in schools? Well, perhaps I'll start. Yes. I mean, for me, it's done three key things that, uh, I mean, it's done many things, but three key things. The first is it's taught us the importance of having a cadre of individuals that are part of our pandemic preparedness. We need to have the institutions to, to ensure we have the surveillance, we have the capacity, we have the scientific leadership that it takes in, in difficult times. And so to me, building the science institutions like the NRF and like research institutions, uh, institutes and so on are very important. The second is that you cannot respond to an epidemic if your healthcare system has fundamental shortcomings. You can't respond to normal healthcare. Responding to a pandemic just is a, is a, is a, is a bridge too far. And so you have to make sure you have a generally well-functioning system. And the third for me is that we've begun to understand that we need to be able to communicate much more clearly with the public in a much more open, transparent way about the insecurities of our evidence, about that we make mistakes. It's not a problem to make mistakes. We are human. But when we make mistakes, we self-correct. When the new evidence becomes available, when we see some effects have happened that we didn't plan or didn't understand, we then go in and we change. And that's a very fundamental thing about how people need to look at that. That, that's, that, that is part and parcel of the scientific process that we, the ability to communicate that, I think is very important. Dr. Technol? Yes, to tag on to that, I think uh, the communication like that is very important. Uh, here in Sweden, we had daily conferences for several months. Now we're down to bi-weekly uh, press conferences. And that's made it possible to, to have this continuous dialogue, I would say, uh, which makes it quite a lot easier to, to sort of change. Because most changes, even in science, are not drastic. Uh, we are slowly gliding from one point of view to the other. And having those daily, more or less, conversation with the public, uh, I think those changes become a lot less drastic than in the other ways. The other point I think which is important to make, and I think is something we need to take with us, is how important it is for agency, the political level, to have a very close dialogue with, with science. Because when we have these kind of drastic events, we really need to understand what are the most essential questions that we need to have answers for now. Um, and to have that dialogue between academia, between science and agencies, the political level, I think then we can sort of prioritize our knowledge much more because in this pandemic, I think hindsight, it's important to realize that we, we took decisions on very scant data to become, to start with. Uh, and that made many of the decisions a bit blunt. Uh, we hit, uh, I think I've said before, we sometimes hit the fly with a hammer which was a bit unnecessary. Now we need to be a lot more precise and we need our science to help us to be that precise, to actually implement countermeasures exactly in a way where they need to be implemented so that the negative effects of the countermeasures can be minimized and the positive effects can be maximized. And I think since this is gonna be a long-term challenge, we really need to come there, not to hurt our populations more than necessary because they already suffered quite a lot from, from this pandemic. Perhaps I should just make one additional point, Mia, if, if you'll indulge me. I mean, when we were originally thinking about how to deal with COVID, we were using influenza mm. as our model because we didn't know what else to use. Mm. Right? We only realized later this disease is so different from influenza, drastically different. It's different in the speed of the spread of the virus. It's different in the mortality rates and the clinical features. 
it's, I mean, it differed in so many ways from, from influenza that naturally, because we were using influenza as our model, we were not always correct. And I think that's part and parcel of how the science grows. Now we have our own model. We don't have to use influenza. We have a COVID understanding of the disease. Thanks, Prof. Um, we have about three, four minutes left for both of you to um, tell us about an issue that many um, questions are coming in at the moment. And that's an immediate issue that we're going to face now. Issues around how we communicate science about vaccines as COVID vaccines become available. Bosov Steenkamp here has a question on how do we convince people to be vaccinated when a vaccine becomes available? And how do we use all these lessons that we've learned about communicating science and uncertainty during COVID to convince people to take up a vaccine when it eventually becomes available and to counter um, vaccine hesitancy. We can start with you, Professor Abdul Karim, and then we can end with Dr. Tegnell. So it's actually very unfortunate that in South Africa, there's quite a, a small but very vocal anti-vaxxer movement. And social media is a mechanism that they use to ampli amplify their very small voice. And I think that that's causing a lot of potential harm. And the reason I make this point is because it is not likely that we are gonna see a home run kind of first vaccine. We're not gonna see something that's 98% effective. We're not gonna see the kinds of highly effective vaccines we have for measles, for example. We're gonna see a vaccine that's partially effective, 50, 60, maybe 70% if we're lucky. So that means for us to achieve herd immunity, we are going to have to vaccinate a very high proportion of the population. So if a significant proportion of the population doesn't take vaccine, they push us down and they prevent us from getting to herd immunity. And herd immunity is key because we need to achieve herd immunity for our economy and our economic recovery to work. We cannot economically recover in the midst of a raging epidemic. That's not possible because people will change their behaviors to adjust for a, a virus that's spreading. So epidemic control or low transmission is more appropriate a term, low transmission is key. And how are we gonna get that? Well, right now we got it because of the first wave, we are gonna probably see a second wave based on what we've seen elsewhere. But ultimately, all of these measures are to get us to a point where a vaccine will enable us to get to as normal a lifestyle as is going to be feasible under very complicated circumstances. Thanks, Prof. Dr. Tegnell? Yeah, I think uh, vaccine is going to be our next big challenge. And uh, we're discussing that a lot in Sweden. Uh, we have a very positive experience of vaccine programs in Sweden. As I said in my talk, 98% of all children in Sweden get vaccinated in our childhood vaccination program. And there is a huge trust in that. Um, we had experience with our vaccination program during the swine flu pandemic 10 years back. And we were able at that time to convince a huge part of the population to get vaccinated. We were up in 50, 60% of the population, probably kind of a world record at that time. But uh, then we had uh, the unfortunate side effects on narcolepsy uh, in Sweden, which has, I don't think really influenced the, the trust in the childhood vaccines because they have remained at the same level. But of course they are in the back of people's mind that that happened last time. Uh, and that's gonna be a communication challenge for us to get through and really get people to understand that this is a, uh, gonna be a safe vaccine. And we really need to work with it not to be in a hurry. I think it's better to wait for a few more weeks and have a, a vaccine we feel safe about than to go out with something we feel a little bit uncertain about because uh, at least in Sweden and in South Africa right now, uh, I think we're prepared to wait a little bit uh, considering the levels we are at. And I think that's much better. So uh, it's going to be a major communication effort. It's going to be a ma major effort of following up because if there are signs of any side effects, we need to catch them very early on and very quickly so we can switch to safer things. Um, 
but hopefully we get something. I have basically the same view as Professor Kasim that we should not expect the first vaccine to be a silver bullet. We're not talking about a world-class vaccine that's going to make us make it possible to eradicate this disease. That is highly unlikely. We're going to get something that's going to make it a little bit easier for us to live a little bit more more, more uh, normal life and make it easier for us to protect the elderly in our populations. And I think that's a good start, but um, we need to be very careful when we do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Technel. We have come to the end of our time today, and it's very clear that there are many challenges still ahead of us with communicating science around COVID and that we would have to take many of the lessons that we've learned to try and build on that, to talk about vaccines and other treatments that become available for COVID. There are many questions that have come in that we have not addressed. I am aware of that. And we would like to, we can speak to the two speakers and see if we can get responses to some of those questions, maybe in writing if there's time. I'd like to thank our two wonderful speakers very much for their time and for sharing their insights with us today. If you'd like to watch this webinar again or send the recording to someone, you can find the live stream recordings on the Facebook pages of the National Research Foundation and also the Swedish Embassy in Pretoria. Everyone who registered for this lecture will also receive a recording of today's event via email and the link to the recording will also be posted on the social media platforms of both organizations. I would like to, on behalf of the Swedish Embassy in South Africa and the National Research Foundation, thank you all for joining the webinar and participating. And on behalf of the two organizations, it's goodbye until next year's Nobel Lecture. Thank you for joining us.